So we have our next plenary speaker, Arun Kumar from NCEP, um, who will be giving the next talk. Arun, whenever you're ready, you can share um, your screen. Arun will be talking about assessing predictability and prediction scale on S2S time scales. And I'll give you a two minute warning before 20 minutes, Arun. And we can okay, uh, can you see the screen? Yeah, it's full screen. Great. All right, thanks Anish and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give this presentation. Uh, so I work in a climate prediction center, which is part of the national, US National Weather Service. Uh, we are in operational centers. We produce a lot of long range uh, forecasts on sub-seasonal and seasonal time scales. So I picked up this topic of predictability and prediction scale on S2S time scales because uh, it's very important for us. Both of these aspects of the long range predictions are very important for us, uh, in, both in quantifying prediction skill of our various forecasts and also trying to understand what the predictability limits uh, on a particular time scale would be. Uh, I'll mainly focus on giving you the example. In giving you the example, I'll mainly focus on seasonal uh, time scale, but uh, the same problems or same methodologies and issues also exist for uh, sub-seasonal time scale. So uh, whatever I say, you can all uh, translate that. It may be in the, in the context of seasonal predictions, but you can translate that in the context of sub-seasonal predictions. Uh, so there are two different aspects of the long range predictions on the S2S uh, time scale. Uh, one is uh, knowing what the prediction scale is. So for example, CPC makes an operational forecast for seasonal mean surface temperature and precipitation anomalies. Uh, we put these forecasts out every season. Uh, so uh, users would like to know what the scale of the, the the average scale of our seasonal predictions are. Um, so in that sense, it's important for us to know, assess, uh, know the prediction skill and do an objective assessment of the quality of the series of the forecasts, uh, which are available to us or which we have done. In the past, uh, assessment, uh, assessments of the prediction skills could be for operational predictions or it could be for uh, individual prediction tools. Uh, and prediction skill is a property of uh, what prediction tool you are using, uh, be it dynamical model or could be, uh, be it empirical prediction tool. The other uh, aspect of the uh, long range forecast or any forecast is what are the predictability limits? I mean, how, how, how much uh, on average uh, you can uh, predict or, or explain the variance of a, a time series for a particular time scale? Uh, so predictability depends on the spatial location and what time average you're looking at. Uh, and it's a property of nature. It's not a property of the prediction tool you are using to uh, provide the forecast. And uh, the, the connection between prediction skill and predictability is that uh, predictability is the upper limit uh, of the prediction skill, or well, what the predictions can achieve, uh, again, using whatever forecast tool you have. And given the predictability limit, uh, prediction skill is a realization of predictability using uh, various forecast tools. Uh, again, they could be dynamical models or uh, they could be empirical prediction systems. Uh, and knowing the predictability uh, is important uh, in the sense that uh, uh, you, get a, uh, you get an estimate how much there is uh, more for room for improvement. Uh, you can set the expectations for the user community in terms of how much uh, these forecasts uh, are going to improve. Uh, it has been a fairly uh, controversial, controversial issue. So you can estimate predictability using uh, various approaches. Uh, these, these efforts have gone back to more than 40 years now. Uh, Anish was showing that uh, a screenshot of the paper by uh, Raul Madden. Uh, in fact, he, he he did a first estimate in 1976 for the monthly mean temperature anomalies over the US. So these efforts have gone uh, far back in time, but it uh, still remains a controversial issue. So to set the context, I'll just give you a couple of examples of the prediction skills. So uh, CPC, Climate Prediction Center, has been making operational forecasts for uh, seasonal 
surface temperature and temper uh, rainfall going back to uh, starting in January 1995. So we have about 25 year history of these archive forecasts, which are operational. And you can uh, assess the, how the scale varies in time or how it varies in the uh, space. Uh, so this is an example of uh, the, the time series of the surface temperature forecast for the seasonal uh, surface temperature uh, going from starting from 1995 to 2030. I just focus on the black curve, ignore the red curve uh, for now. Uh, so right panel is the, the skill, uh, a particular skill measure which we use, uh, which is called high case skill score, uh, the time series of that particular skill measure from starting from 95 to uh, 2020. And the small inset panel is just the 11th month running mean of the, uh, the time series shown on the left. The property of this skill measure is that if the forecast is perfect, then the score is 100. Uh, if the forecast is same as the climatology, that's, then the skill score is zero. And if forecast is wrong everywhere, then the, the skill is minus 50. Uh, the average of the black line is 14.7. Uh, uh, the best you can make, the best this number can get is 100, uh, like uh, for anomaly correlation. Uh, so the, this average of uh, the seasonal forecast skill over this 25 year period, which is 14.7 is much below uh, what the maximum could be. So that the skill in, in long range forecast is a fairly well established fact, uh, both on the sub seasonal and seasonal time scale is uh, fairly low compared to what the predict, uh, skill for the weather predictions is. Another thing to notice is that uh, there are lots of ups and downs. Uh, sometimes the scale is high, other times the scale is low. Uh, it, you could see it better in the right panel. So if you just focus on the black line, so sometimes it goes up, sometimes it gets close to zero. So there are a lot of uh, ups and downs in terms of uh, scale of the individual forecast. Uh, the main message I want to convey here is that uh, the average skill over this 25 year period uh, is about uh, 15. Uh, out of what the possible maximum could be, uh, which is 100. You can look at the same figure and a special uh, a special map. So this 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 the skill for a particular time is uh, comparing the forecast map over the U.S. against the for, uh, the observed map uh, observed anomalies over the U.S. Uh, you can also do the, the skill measure in time and plot a spatial distribution. So that's shown on the, uh, the left panel here. So this is the same skill score uh, over the US uh, for the service temperature, uh, evaluated over 25 years. Uh, the red colors are better skill. The yellowish colors are, 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 are smaller skill. Uh, so in general, uh, you can see the spatial distribution of the skill of the surface temperature forecast over the US going back uh, 25 years. Uh, so there are some regions where the skill is higher. The other uh, regions like Midwest and uh, uh, upper state, uh, upper Midwest state, upper Midwest states over the US where the scale is lower uh, based on the assessment of 25 years. And again, uh, the, the typical color range is from kind of oranges to red, and the scale over those regions is about 25 to 30, uh, which is again fairly low compared to what the maximum could be. Uh, so this is just not the case with the operational forecast. I mean, you can look at the dynamical forecast also, which is shown, an example is shown in the right, right end panel. Uh, this is for the, the seasonal forecast system. Uh, running at uh, NCEP called CFS version two. Uh, so these are the hindcast from 1982 to 2010. Uh, you can look at the monthly mean rainfall, do an assessment of uh, scale of the uh, rainfall over this period. And what's shown is an anomaly correlation. The scale here is yellowish color goes from uh, between 0.1 to 0.2 and brownish colors are somewhere between 0.7 and 0.8. So again, you can see uh, a regionality in the scale. And in general, except for very few places uh, where the ENSO signal is, uh, the scale is fairly low. Uh, so these are some average assessments of the scale. Let me give you a more specific example. So this is an example of a forecast made by CPC for the winter of DJF 2015-16 El Nino. Uh, this was one of the biggest El Nino in the historical record we have. So the SST anomaly that, that at the top, top left panel 
Uh, our forecast was uh, shown in the, in the right panel. Uh, so the green colors indicate a, a chance for above normal rainfall anomaly. And the yellow and brownish color indicate a chance for below normal uh, anomalies. And then those who are familiar with the ENSO signal, this, this is very much like the composite of the ENSO signal over the US. So this was the prediction uh, and what, what actually happened or what was observed for the DGF 2015-16 is this the bottom, uh, bottom left panel. So in fact, instead of above normal rainfall anomaly, you have below normal rain. So below normal rainfall anomaly over the California, which is shown in the reddish colors. And there is a above normal uh, rainfall anomaly over uh, Washington, uh, over the Oregon and Washington and the West, uh, along the northern and west coast of the U.S. So the forecast was almost uh, fairly uh, uh, almost opposite to what the, the sorry the observations were fairly almost opposite to the, what the forecast was, given that this was a, a one of the biggest El Nino years and you expect the forecast to be better during that. Uh, then, then this gave. Uh, we got, got into a fair bit of issues in terms of verifying or uh, communicating this forecast to the user community. So this is an example of individual forecasts. Uh, you can do it other, other years or other, uh, other individual cases, but the bottom line is that based on a lot of assessments of the long range forecast, be they in the subseasonal time scale or in the uh, seasonal time scale, the general impression is the prediction scale is fairly low. Uh, this yeah, so raises a fundamental question, is the, the low scale and artifact of the moral biases? Um, as you heard in the previous talks, there are uh, issues with the morals and that might lead to uh, a lower realization of the prediction skill uh, from the predictability or is it because of the natural constraint imposed by the predictability? And an answer to these questions, uh, both on the sub-seasonal and seasonal time scales are, are fairly important. Uh, there's a, uh, you can use various tools or various data sets to understand uh, reasons for low prediction skills. Uh, you can look, look at multiple models, uh, or various dynamical systems or empirical prediction systems, uh, come assess the skill and see if there is general agreement in the amplitude and or the special variability uh, in the skill. And if, if every method get, starts to give you the same uh, same pattern and same amplitude, then you will might start to believe uh, this is more because of the natural constraints on the predictability. <clears throat> you can also estimate the predictability uh, going beyond the prediction scale and also use uh, modeling systems and, and multi-model prediction systems. So I'm just going to uh, give you some examples of uh, assessing the prediction scale uh, and the predictability base of the California rainfall during DJF winters uh, based on the North American multi-model ensembles. Uh, the models used are listed here, but it's not important. There are seven different models. Each has a, a different ensemble size, uh, depending on uh, for, for the seasonal predictions. Uh, and has a fairly, ex fairly extensive data set, which can be used for assessments of prediction scale and predictability in the seasonal time scale. You can use a similar uh, Multi-model uh, and uh, databases uh, related to uh, S2S project uh, hosted by ECMWF or the sub sub X project uh, running in the US. Uh, so that's a very basic thing you, you can first do is to take all these seven models, uh, check their climatology over the California, uh, check the standard deviation of the rainfall over California, and look at the regression between you know, 3.4 uh, and the rainfall anomaly over, over the California. Uh, this is just a, a vertically stretched uh, display of the, the, the grid points along the California coast, uh, indicated in a small black box at the top right panel. The message here is, uh, by and large, so if you, the last panel is the observation here. So all the models uh, have basic sense of what the climatology of the rainfall is. Uh, what the standard deviation of the rainfall is and what the ENSO regression or ENSO response over the California is. And they all have different depictions. Uh, it depends on your viewpoint, whether the glass is half full or, or half empty. Uh, you can uh, believe or criticize these models on an individual basis in terms of their biases. So if you look, for example, if you look at the regression patterns, uh, the observed anomalies as 
when when El Nino is there, it has high rainfall uh, over the west coast, uh, southern west coast over California, and it has a lower rainfall over Oregon and Washington. Almost every model replicates that. Uh, almost all the seven models replicate that patterns are there, drier over the north and wetter over the uh, over the, the southern uh, coast of the western U.S. Uh, so you can uh, so it provides some basic assessment of what these models can do individually, and you can also do a multi-model ensemble mean and look, look at what the skill might be or what the characteristics of the multi-model ensemble might be. Hey, Aaron, you have five minutes, including questions. Yeah, so you can look at the signal to noise and the skill of these forecasts. So the top panel here is the uh, skill of the individual models in the terms of anomaly correlation. Just look at the, the, the last panel in the top, which is the skill of the NMME. Uh, the message here is, again, the skill is somewhere between 0.4 to 0.5 or, or, or the Western coast. So the skill across all the models or average of all the models is, is fairly low. Uh, you can look at the individual events. Uh, so uh, the top panel here is the forecast uh, for, uh, so what, what we did was to pick up 11 early no years going from 2014 uh, to 2015. And uh, these are ranked uh, in terms of the amplitude of Nino 3.4 anomaly. The last panel is the composite uh, for all these events. And the bottom panel is the observations. Uh, so, uh, so NMME is ensemble mean forecast. Uh, so it gives a very consistent forecast across all the uh, 11 uh, you know, years. It's drier over the northern west coast, uh, wetter over the southern southern uh, west coast of the U.S. But the observed anomalies are all over the place. Some events are opposite to what the composite is. Uh, some are uh, in, in the uh, same sign as the composite. And the last three panels, which are the observed anomalies for 82, 82 83, 97, and 2015, uh, which were the three strongest that Lino years share some resemblance, but uh, they could be very different. Uh, another way to look at it would be uh, you could just look at the consistency uh, among the models across all the 11 Linos. So again, just focus on the, the, the two panels at the right. The top one is the top right. Um, Farthermost right panel is the observations and the bottom is NME. The color uh, scheme here is if all seven models agree in the sign of their anomalies, then it's uh, kind of uh, either dark brown or dark green. Uh, while so there's very good consistency among the NME forecast systems, uh, there is very little con uh, case by case consistency in, in terms of observations. So uh, what, what this is saying is that although uh, all the uh, forecast for 11 Alino years across NMME. For, for all 11 Alino years, we'll predict a below normal rainfall anomaly. So the northern part of the west coast of the US, it will predict a below above normal rainfall anomaly over the southern part of the US west coast. And these predictions are very consistent across uh, different Alino years. The same kind of consistency uh, it does not exist in observation. So there's a lot more variability in the observations compared to uh, variability within uh, within the forecast. And that's the basic reason that uh, the skill is very low uh, for, uh, for the long range forecast. So there's a lot of noise in the, in the system, which is not, uh, which cannot be predicted. So this sort of indicates that what you're seeing in terms of uh, long range forecast, the low prediction skill uh, might be because of uh, lower predictability limits, and it depends on which region you're looking at. Uh, so if, if you were to do uh, the same kind of analysis over the Southeast uh, US, your prediction skill would be higher. Uh, the consistency among for ensemble mean forecast would be about the same what you're seeing over the Western coast. But the consistency among observations across different Alino years will be uh, much higher than you're seeing over the Western US. Uh, so. Doing this analysis regionally also gives you some some uh, some basic assessment of what the, the spatial variability in the in the rainfall would be. Oh, sorry, in the predictability would be. Uh, so, uh, given these all these uh, wonderful data sets we have for the seasonal forecast, for the subseasonal forecast, you can do a lot of uh, fundamental or basic science stuff uh, looking at the assessments of the forecast skill, uh, you can look at, look at the predictability uh, and these assessments starts to give you some estimate of what the predictability limits might be. 
it seems that it, 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 the low prediction skill might be because of uh, low predictability limits, but it's not guaranteed. Uh, all these estimates are based uh, model based, so there, there's a lot of room for erroneous con conclusions. Uh, uh, models may share uh, common biases, uh, all have errors, so they might all be giving the low uh, estimates or some key physical aspects of uh, key, key physical process uh, or the aspects of the climate variability may not be represented in these models. So you just keep repeating these things as the newer generation of the model come along and build up a history of these things and every five, 10 years have a systematic assessment of what the prediction scale and predictability limits are. Going beyond that, uh, it raises a lot of interesting questions. So again, if you compare the consistency among the forecast and MME and observations, you see a big difference. And this difference could be there that uh, if if the model response uh, to and so is very linear in the in in the models compared to in the observation, if that happens, then this this case could could arise. So the questions you can ask is how linear is the atmospheric response to and so can we uh, get very uh, can we get a handle on these things? Uh, what the influence are and ends of flavors, so uh, there's a, a Central Pacific and so uh, an Eastern Pacific and, uh, and so what's the there is influence on the atmospheric responses, uh, how the spread of the or the noise of the seedle mean changes uh, uh, with the amplitude and, and structure of and so and so on. So uh, these are some very fundamental questions for our prediction scale and predictability on seasonal time scale. And uh, similar questions exist for uh, sub seasonal time scale. And I'll stop there. Uh, thanks for your uh, attention. Thanks, Sarun. Um, yeah, really great points and questions for future research as well. Antje has a question. Antje, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Um, yes, I try to formulate it as in the chat, like how important do you think are the skill levels if you look at at so say the source of seasonal predictability like ENSO versus um, the skill in, in, in predicting the propagation of the of the signal elsewhere to the exotropics or so. Do you have a feel of uh, you know where you know you spoke about relatively low levels of skill where where this reduction of the, the potential skill mostly comes from and an and, and, and implication of what could be perhaps improved in the future? So the indication so far is, uh, or at least some, some level of consensus, consensus in the community is that a lot of errors might be coming from representing the tropical rainfall. Uh, and and the tele, uh, once you have the errors in the tropical rainfall and the response to different MJO, uh, errors in the in response to, in conjunction with the MJO or ENSO variability, uh, those errors in the rainfall anomalies might lead, lead, lead to errors in the teleconnections uh, or the extratropical latitudes. Uh, there, there could also be errors in the mean state in between extratropics and tropics, which might uh, influence the propagation of teleconnection patterns from the tropics uh, beyond. Uh, but I guess most, uh, I sort of consensus would be that a lot of errors might be coming from uh, tropical rainfall and air sea interactions in the tropics and a lot of focus or field programs devoted to uh, that aspects of improving the climate models and their performance great thanks Antje. thanks arun judith you have a question thank you so much for your talk um I would be interested if you comment a little on state dependent predictability associated with the PNA state, especially for the Western United States and to which degree this is similar or not similar uh, to the predictability from NAO uh, over Europe. Right, so I mean, uh, uh, the assessment of predictability or prediction skill like shown in this diagram are across uh, all the all kind of answers. Uh, it, it includes normal years, uh, La Nina years and Alina years. Uh, the ideal would be uh, to have a, a state or, or a conditional estimate of prediction scale. Uh, so for example, just, just for the Alinos 
or just for the uh, Central Pacific or Eastern Pacific, I mean, knows, or the assessment of prediction skill uh, condition to other factors. So El Nino, when the, you have an arc, Arctic oscillation or a positive or negative phase of AO or NAO, but uh, that's one of the, the goal, eventual goals where it's very hard to uh, pull out that information. I mean, given we have only 25, 30 years history of the data, anything beyond uh, assessing the skill beyond uh, across all 30 years, do, trying to condition it uh, on individual parameters gets very hard. You might, at least in the seasonal time scale, it might have better chance or, or, or better luck on the sub-seasonal time scale where the sampling, uh, the sample, the, the, the verification sample data set might be longer. So yeah, Judith, it's, it's an important thing, but it's very hard to approach or answer this uh, given the data sets of the forecast history we have. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Judith. Thanks, everyone. Don't see other questions in the chat. I had one, Arun. Actually, it's um, coming back to Shui's question to Tim earlier this morning in terms of using imperfect simple models to assess predictability. This seems to be dominating in our community. And how do we change this uh, in terms of understanding the true limits on predictability versus what imperfect models are giving us uh, as limits on predictability. Right, so yeah, so the model-based estimates are limited because based on the, what the biases in the models are, uh, but uh, you could uh, use range of methodology. So if you go back to the Royal Madden paper, it was just purely based on the autocorrelation of the weather time series. Uh, Purely observed time series. Uh, so that's one method. Uh, it has been done repeatedly over and over uh, as the uh, observational data records has become longer and longer. Uh, so that, that's one way to just using purely observational data set for seasonal time scale. You can do the same for sub seasonal. Uh, there's no errors there, but except uh, what methodologies you use, you can use the linear base forecast and empirical forecast tools like connecting ENSO anomalies or MGO anomalies with other parts of the globe, uh, do a, a linear reconstruction uh, and see what the estimates of predictability are. So those are purely observational uh, approaches. And then ultimately, I mean, you could have uh, hierarchy of models, you can do the AMIP runs, where SSCs are perfectly there, but here see interactions are not. Or you can finally have a couple of models uh, which have everything thrown in there. So there are already, uh, at least for the seasonal hierarchy of uh, approaches to do, estimate these things. And uh, you just had to put it all together and uh, look at it from a distance and see what, what answers you're getting uh, and whether you can make sense out of those things or not, or you can reach a, reach a, a more convincing conclusion. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. Thanks again, Arun. Yeah, there was a Thank yeah, you. great talk and great set of questions for future research. Thanks, Anish.